drives it to left. Down into the corner it goes, and that is a home run! Up and away in an opposite field home run down the line to right for Giancarlo. Swung on and missed strike three. Down the middle for strike three. Darvish ultimately wins the battle for his fifth K of the night. All the way back goes Orlando to the wall, leaping by Kane, Lorenzo Kane. Oh, the Bruce is loose, all right. His second home run of this game. Popped him up in the shallow center. Charging Souza. Here he comes. Dives and makes the catch to retire the side. Very good in for one, and that's going to get out of here. Way back. Oh. Holy Toledo. Welcome to 1225 Live. The three-team trade that everyone is buzzing about gives the Yankees and Diamondbacks some much-needed depth. We'll talk about how this trade affects all three teams involved with Richard Justice in just a little bit here on the show. He's also going to tell us why the Phillies have not signed Jake Arrieta yet and also a dark horse team for the Bryce Harper Sweet Stakes, maybe a team that you haven't even thought about yet. So join us with Richard Justice in just a little bit. We are also live from Camelback Ranch with Alana Rizzo to break down the Dodgers spring training camp and what it's going to mean for them to be able to shake off that Game 7 World Series loss and have a bright new outlook for 2018. We also always start the show with Danny Wexman, but she is down in Florida and Bradenton, and she had talked to a couple of pirates down there in spring training camp. She had a couple of uh, laughs with them, so we're going to check in with her in just a little bit. But we're going to start the show today with some more details about that three-team trade. Here you go in case you haven't seen it. The Diamondbacks get Steven Souza Jr., who hit 30 homers and 78 RBI to help out with some of that outfield depth. Obviously, they lost J.D. Martinez to the Red Sox in free agency. Remember, they also signed Gerard Dyson this week to help out. They moved some prospects. They also sent Brandon Drury to the Yankees, which creates an interesting position battle for starting spots at second and third between Drury, Miguel Andujar, and Glaber Torres. The Rays, by the way, take home two prospects and two players to be named later. What does this all mean? Mainly that two contenders create depth where they need it the most without spending on the free agent market. We're going to break it all down further with Richard Justice in just a little bit. So uh, make sure you stay with us. All right. Like we mentioned, we usually start off the show with Danny Wexham, and we're going to welcome her to the show right now. Danny, you are in Bradenton at Pirates Camp. Uh, and my question to you is, with no Andrew McCutcheon there, Danny, by the way, it's great to see your face and great to see you getting some sun there. You look fantastic. Uh, but with no Andrew McCutcheon there, who's the face of this franchise now? <laughs> That's a great question, Lex. Uh, great to be talking to you. So a couple of things. Number one, Clint Hurdle talked to him this morning, and he's optimistic. That's the word I would use in camp. Everyone's optimistic. They know that they lost some big names and some big guys, but they don't care what the rest of the NL Central did. They care about what their team is doing, what the future of their team is. The face, I don't know about the face, but I can tell you a couple things about the veteran guys that they have here. Obviously, in left field, that spot is open. Adam Frazier will be going for that, and he will be working very hard to earn that starting spot. And then you also have Josh Bell, who's coming off a huge season last year. He just wants to get better. He wants to improve. Francisco Cervelli, maybe this guy is the face. He told me today, you know, obviously every team says they want to win. They want to stay healthy. That's the priority list. But Cervelli said he wants to win a gold glove. He wants to get that for himself, which is pretty cool. He hasn't done that yet in his career. Jamison Tyone, this guy is trying to be the ace of the staff. And I, I asked him, I said, which guy do you want to face most this season? Who are you looking forward to? And he said, Anthony Rizzo, which I think you would love that answer, Lex. And then lastly, Joe Musgrove, who's adding, not only did he switch divisions, but he's also moving from the bullpen to the starting rotation. So he's coming from a championship caliber team. He's going to bring the leadership and the knowledge, and he's pumped to go back to the starting rotation. So the team has a ton of leaders. There's a lot going on here. Optimism. That's what they're going for here, Lex. Danny, it's so crazy. You've only been there for a couple of hours, and you've gained so much knowledge. I feel like you're an expert on the Pirates right now. This is awesome. Uh, you've also had some fun with a couple of these guys, Jordy Mercer and Josh Bell, what they have to say. Yeah, that's right. So people can surprise you, Lex, and I have been surprised here at Photo Day with these players. I had a lot of fun. Check it out. I'm here with Jordy Mercer. Jordy's going to pick a card, and then we're going to ask a question. My friend? Okay, what do you got? Can I show it to you? Show it to me. This isn't a, this isn't a magic trick. Ace. Food that you can't live without. Oh, man, that's a tough one. Um, 
I'm a sucker for like peanut M and M's. Oh, they're really good, and also uh, peas. Does that sound gross? Peas. I like peas though. Sorry. Oh come on. Who is the jokester on the team? Who's making everyone laugh in the clubhouse? Um, I'd say I'd say Jay. Whenever we have like a a rain delay or something like that, um, there's like like a country song that plays, um, and he's he's the first one to start dancing, doing the two step. And, you know, our fans in Pittsburgh really like that. Um, something that I'll probably never be able to do. My favorite emoji. Thumbs up. I'd have to say, like, the laughing, crying face one that's just, like, dying. Uh, so it's just like, oh, oh, God. Favorite baseball memories from any time ever? Um, okay, I got a cool story. Um, it was 2012. My last or my first year up in the big leagues, and we are playing the Braves. Chipper Jones is last year. He's my favorite player. So I'm up leaning up against the cage, acting cool, trying to act cool. And he walks up, and I was like turning around, and like there he is. And I was like, I just turn around and walk the other way. Favorite teammates ever. Um, let's see, let's see. Uh. First and foremost, I'd have to say uh, David Fries, because he's uh, a guy that uh, I've, I've watched for a long time, being a, a Rangers fan growing up, um, kind of watching him single-handedly, you know, tear my hopes and dreams <laughs> away from me. I'm sorry that that happened to you. I hope you get a chance to redeem yourself one day. He actually did sign a jersey for me, though, so it's it all worked out great. Yes, okay. Very good. Totally redeems himself, Danny. That's uh, that's our favorite story always, the, uh, the redemption song. Uh, and, and that was so cool. And I love the fact that you're just kind of guiding them, too. Like, here, put the mic in front of your face, and uh, this is how you do this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I tried to do my best. And, Lex, as you can see behind me, they're taking live BP, uh, if I move to the side a little bit. So they've been going for about an hour now, and guys are just taking their hacks. And... Um, I've been watching a bunch of different stuff here, but like I said, the theme in Pirates Camp for Pirates fans who may be watching is optimism. They're, they don't want to be counted out. They don't care what the other teams did, uh, and they're ready to rock and roll in 2018. And I had a blast here today. I'm so excited that I got to talk to you. Thanks for uh, chatting with me and letting me hang out today. Thanks for joining us, Danny, and thanks for all that info. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying that sunshine. We'll check in in a little bit. See you, Danny. All right, uh, by the way, speaking of live VP, that was pretty cool to be able to get some live footage there. Uh, this was really awesome. We're seeing Madison Bumgarner and Andy McCutcheon go up against uh, each other for the first time, and Kutch gets a hold of one. This is out of the park. Now, yes, it's just a BP home run, but look at Mad Bum. Look at the reaction he's got. He's like, oh, man, this guy. Hopefully I'm going to watch him do this against uh, other pitchers throughout the season and not so much me. But the best part was Buster Posey shoves him out of the box afterwards. Like, that's not how we treat uh, our pitchers here, especially your first time against him. Pretty cool stuff. All right, our question of the day. We want to ask you what your dream spring training matchup is between two guys on the same team. Maybe they're from your team or from a different team. So I'll give you a couple examples. Like for me, I would love to see Steven Strasburg against Bryce Harper. That would be a pretty awesome matchup. Or, you know, if you're a Cubs fan, you Darvish versus Kyle Schwarber. Uh, see if he can rip another home run off of him. That would be pretty cool. Like a Bartolo Colon versus Adrian Beltre. Whatever the combination is, make sure you send those in to us, and we'll read them a little bit later on in the show. All right, it's time for us to head to Phoenix, where Alana Rizzo and the Dodgers, uh, who is the Dodgers host and reporter for uh, Sportsnet LA, joins us right now to talk about this Dodgers team and what they are poised to do for 2018. Alana, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate uh, having you on the show. Oh, you're welcome, Alexa. Good to be here. So I want to ask you, you know, they got to shake off the sting of this Game 7 World Series loss. What's the mentality? What is everyone saying coming into camp with a, you know, a fresh new outlook for 2018? I think it depends on who you ask. A lot of the guys, of course, were incredibly upset as soon as the Game 7 was over of that World Series. But they didn't really labor on it for too long. Clayton Kershaw himself said, you know what, it's not something that I ever get over. It's just something that I've absorbed. He said, I might look back on it a little bit later on in my career when it is over. But as of right now, this is a team that's incredibly focused as far as heading into the 2018 season. For the most part, it's the exact same team that actually went to the World Series last year. So, of course, they were upset as soon as it ended. Some guys were very emotional about it. Other guys just internalized it. Clayton Kershaw absorbed it, but really they've put it past him at this point. And for the most part, everybody came to camp uh, a week early, earlier than they were supposed to as far as position players were concerned. So uh, they're ready to go, and uh, it's, it's very much a workmanlike mentality here at camp. 
Well, like you're pointing out, not many major moves for this Dodgers team in the offseason, whereas if you look around the rest of the division, almost every other team made a huge move. What's the philosophy there for the Dodgers? I don't think they feel that they need to make any moves. I think for the most part, the team is pretty much intact from the 2017 team. Of course, Hugh Darvish is now a member of the Chicago Cubs. And of course, Hugh Darvish was a rental for the Dodgers at that non-waiver trade deadline at the end of July last year to help them in that postseason. The Dodgers, in my opinion, were going to the postseason regardless of the Hugh Darvish acquisition. And he didn't necessarily pan out for them in the postseason. So while they absolutely admire him and liked what he did with them here during the regular season. Um, they don't see it as a huge loss. They have five guys in their rotation, four of which started at least 25 or more games last year. Hyunjin Ryu started 24 games last year. So they have a pretty solid rotation that all have another year of experience under their belt. It wasn't a situation in which Clayton Kershaw had to do everything. So it is a very left-handed heavy rotation, but they're all very different lefties as far as the four lefties in their starting rotation are concerned. Kenta Maeda, the only right-hander. So they didn't feel that they had to bring back a lot of uh, um, extra people, if you will, or have a big acquisition. They feel very confident in the team that they already have. All right, a couple of injury questions for you just to keep everyone updated. Alex Wood tweaked his ankle, and Corey Seager is rehabbing that elbow. Any question about these two guys being available for opening day? Now, Corey Seager, actually, this is his third straight spring in which he's had a bit of a delayed workout program. He was dealing with a knee issue a couple of years ago. He was dealing with a back issue last year, and this year it happens to be the back and the elbow. The good thing for Corey Seager is that he didn't have to have off-season surgery. He was able to rest it and rehab it. And while he's a bit delayed as far as the workouts are concerned, um, as far as him wanting to get out a little further uh, past 100 feet, as far as throwing and then throwing to bases, um, he feels pretty confident, 100% confident, in fact, that he will be ready to go for opening day. Um, he's going to participate as the DH in games this weekend. You know, he's a little bit delayed on the throwing program, but Corey will be fine. As far as Alex Wood is concerned, he says that he um, is definitely good to go for opening day. I mean, they're holding him back a little bit as far as bullpens, but they're really holding a lot of guys back as far as workload is concerned. Kenley Jansen being one of those guys. Clayton Kershaw, to the extent, is being held back on his weight training program, not his throwing program. But as far as Alex Wood and Corey Seager, to your question, they were they are both healthy for the most part and will be fine. All right, sounds good. Speaking of opening day, Clayton Kershaw has already been named the opening day starter for the eighth straight year. Pretty incredible. And obviously, to no one's surprise there, but he could potentially opt out of his contract at the end of this season. And I know a lot of people like to talk, start the talks really early, especially in spring, about what his future is going to be. What are both sides saying, both Kershaw's camp and the team, about his future in L.A.? Well, Clayton Kershaw doesn't generally talk about his contract situation openly with many people. He has said uh, within the month, of course, that it's not something. It's nice to have options, and it's not anything that he can necessarily control if he doesn't pitch well. His his biggest concern is being healthy, going out there and pitching every fifth day. And as he said, it's it's nice to have those options. Farhan Zaidi, the general manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, saying as recently as of yesterday that there's continued dialogue with Clayton Kershaw, and he is their franchise player. There's certain neither side is committing to whether or not they're going to talk extensions right now or what have you. Um, Clayton likes the fact that he has options. The Dodgers want him to be here naturally. Um, it has to work for both sides. Clayton has said in the past he'd like to retire as a Dodger, um, but certainly, as we all know, things can change, and uh, the free agent market as of right now isn't an interesting place to be. So I'm sure that will factor into Clayton's decision as well. Um, as of right now, he's he's a Dodger for life uh, until anything changes. All right, sounds good. I was checking out your Twitter feed, and uh, an interesting tweet kind of uh, came across and uh, really made me smile. It brightened my day. I'm telling you, this is pretty awesome. For those who didn't see it, let's just share it with everyone. Point out that uh, you did a 15-minute interview with Yasiel Puig, and he did the interview in English, where he wasn't 100% comfortable, but he pushed himself anyway out of his comfort zone. And to me, that is so awesome to hear. Tell me a little bit about this interview. What were the highlights of that conversation? Yasiel Puig is a guy that continues to push the limits um, for good or for bad. And yesterday, we had an opportunity to sit down with him. We have these interviews on Sportsnet LA called Connected With Interviews, where they're long-form interviews. And I would always have done those interviews in English and in Spanish with him and every postseason or excuse me, you know, post game interview I do with him is, is typically in Spanish. But I told him we were doing it in English and at first he kind of rolled his eyes in the way that he does, but then he did it and he was a bit uncomfortable having to express himself for that length of time in English, but he does continue to push the limits and does continue to try. And one of the highlights of the interview itself was the fact that he has great admiration and respect for the Dodgers hitting coach Turner Ward. And every time he does something well offensively, which he tended to do last year with 28 home runs, 
he gives Turner Ward a huge kiss, and we call him the kissing bandit. And he said he was going to continue to do that. And Turner's from Alabama, and he said he was going to go in the middle of the state of Alabama and give Turner Ward a huge kiss, which obviously uh, you can understand the dynamic of that situation. He said he might do it at the, the University of Alabama and do it in front of Nick Saban. So Yasiel Puig has a great personality. I know that um, he's a lightning rod, and I can certainly appreciate that and, and understand why people may think that. But he has grown leaps and bounds as far as his commitment to learning the language and trying to do things in English. And I know how difficult it is for players where English isn't their first language to have to sit down and do an on-camera interview in a, in a language that they're not certainly that comfortable with. So I do appreciate the fact that he did that. Yeah, absolutely. And he's one of our favorite personalities in the league. He's just so fun, honestly. Just the licking of the bat is so different and unique and uh, kind of gross, but also kind of or cool. Or gross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, we love it. And, uh, you know, that's just him. He's, he's a unique guy. All right, so Dodgers, best regular season record last year, and uh, a lot of people are predicting them to win the World Series this year. Why do you think that 2018 is the Dodgers' year? You know, it's going to be difficult for a team that won 104 games in the regular season and took it all the way to Game 7 of the World Series to get any better. The only thing that they can do that's better is win the World Series. And I think the fact that, uh, you know, the Pocota projections have them winning 99 games, which you can put whatever sort of value in, in those sort of preseason projections that you want to. But this is a team that's pretty much exactly the same team. I mean, they lost a couple of pieces out of their bullpen, primarily Brandon Morrow, who is now obviously a member of the Chicago Cubs. But they feel like they have pieces that can fill in as far as Scott Alexander is concerned and perhaps Tom Kohler, who is going to be used likely as a spot starter as well. Um, you have Chase Utley back, which is not going to see a lot of at-bats or plate appearances, but what he does as far as that clubhouse leadership is, is something that is invaluable. And they have their key guys. They didn't have to go out uh, in the offseason and get any sort of free agents because they really locked up their key guys last offseason. Um, they have pretty much the exact same rotation that they did last year with the exception of you Darvish moving on to the Cubs. And uh, they just, they're confident. This is a team that, you know, every single game, with the exception of a horrible game seven, uh, could have gone either way, and it was down to the wire, and they're incredibly talented. And on top of that, the younger guys have one more year of experience under their belts. I mean, two guys are back-to-back -back rookie of the years, have, have another year of experience, and they feel there's no reason that uh, they can't go back to the World Series and hopefully win it this year. Man, I'm looking forward to that. This crew is uh, so fun to watch, and I know it's going to continue into 2018. All right, looking ahead to next offseason, one of the biggest free agents is going to be Bryce Harper. What are the chances that the Dodgers break Nationals fans' hearts and sign Bryce Harper in the offseason? You know, of course, every single Dodgers fan, I think every single baseball fan wants that particular player uh, and that left-handed bat on, on their team. I think it depends on where the Dodgers are at as far as payroll is concerned. I know everybody assumes that they're just going to go over that threshold and the tax and, and be able to just sign, you know, 50 billion players um, and have no limit as far as the checkbook is concerned. But I think the ownership group is kind of not trending necessarily in that direction. I mean, the Dodgers will continue to spend, but it has to be the right fit. And... You know, I think the Nationals, of course, are certainly going to make a play to keep him. I think uh, the other, you know, besides the Dodgers, the other 28 teams are certainly going to do what they can, too. It'll be interesting to see what happens as far as the Dodgers outfield is concerned at that point. Of course, you're going to want Bryce Harper. You'll make room for him if you have the money to do it. But the Dodgers year in and year out have a very um, overcrowded outfield. They do again this year. Um, when his time is up, I'm sure they'll be they'll be very interested in, in talking to him. I'm not sure if, if the money uh, is, is going to fit. All right. We'll see how that all works out. Alana, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it and enjoy camp. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you. All right. In the wake of the tragic fatal shooting in Florida that happened this week, MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred has created an initiative for baseball to get involved in the healing process for the victims and their families. Here is Commissioner Rob Manfred on how those efforts will be carried out this spring. All of the teams in Florida uh, will be wearing commemorative hats during their game in, in, games in Florida on Friday. Um, you know, it was a tragedy. Um, it was a tragedy that um, hit the state of Florida where we have two teams, but obviously had very specific baseball connections um, a a as well. And, um, it, you know, really a very strong sentiment in the clubs that it was the appropriate thing to do um, immediately. <laughs> So this is going to be an initiative across baseball, but the Reds tweeted out that the team is going to join, obviously, in this initiative to honor the victims of the shooting by wearing these Stoneman Douglas high school hats. And 
there is the image of the hat right there that they will be wearing for that opening spring training game. Uh, a link to donate is there on the page if you want to check it out. You can also go online to donate at GoFundMe.com slash Stoneman Douglas Victims Fund. All right, switching gears here as we wanted to remind you about our question of the day. We wanted to ask you about your dream spring training matchup. If you could see two guys from your own team go head to head, maybe like a Clayton Kershaw and a Justin Turner going at it in spring training at live VP, who would you want to see? So uh, we'll get some of those answers in just a little bit and share them with the rest of us. All right, time for us to head back to Phoenix as we welcome in Richard Justice. And Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. We want to ask you about this three-team trade, which is kind of wild. Steven Sousa Jr. goes to the Diamondbacks, Brandon Drury to the Yankees. Uh, what did you make? What was your biggest takeaway from this whole trade? Uh, three quick things. Alexa, the Diamondbacks really did a good job. They filled a big need, and you know, potentially their last need, and it's finished a really nice offseason. The second thing is probably what you already know. The Yankees are really smart. Drury is a very high upside guy. He protects them all over the infield. He's 25 years old. He's like, he reminds me of when they went out and got Aaron Hicks. They said, we don't know what he's going to be as a finished product, but he's got all these tools and he's willing to play a lot of different positions. Position is a very athletic guy. I think this is what really good teams do. They protect themselves in every way they can. And the third thing is the Rays are really rebuilding. And my friends Chris Archer and Kevin Kiermaier, I don't know how much longer they're going to be there, but if they're there on opening day, it's going to be plenty awkward. You know, there is a, there's a process to going through something like this. I'm with the White Sox today, and they've got a ton of young talent, a lot of that from trades, but it's pretty painful. And for Chris Archer and Kevin Kiermaier, they're the last two guys standing, it looks like. Yeah, this uh, trade is going to create an interesting battle at Yankees camp, too, for some opening day spots. Between Drury and Miguel Andahar and Glaber Torres, who do you think makes this opening day roster? Well, I, I think there may be um, – I was going to say there may be more questions about Miguel Andujar that I think Drury definitely makes the club. And Glaber Torres, you know, the, the, the conventional thinking is you send both Andujar and Torres down – and for a month or two to get an extra year of arbitration. But, you know, that's just not how the Yankees work. And I was going to say that Andujar, there's probably more concern about his readiness for the big leagues. But then I'm told he put on, he put on a laser show yesterday in batting practice. And look, if, if it's going to be, may the best man win. But I think Drury probably makes the team regardless because he protects them all over the place. But it's going to be fun. And, you know, this is part of what, why, what Brian Cashman has done is so remarkable in that you took a team you didn't really back off that much and you rebuilt your farm system and Andujar and Torres are two of the final um, pieces to show how what a great job he has done along with Greg Bird and Aaron Judge and Gary Sanchez and etc. All right, so that trade helps out the Yankees and the Diamondbacks, but there are still free agents on the market who could help out teams this year. It's really crazy. And we heard that Jake Arrieta was in talks with the Phillies potentially. What's holding up these two sides from getting this deal done, which I think would actually be a perfect fit? Yeah, it would be a perfect fit, and the Phillies have money to spend. You know, it's still the story in the world. Uh, the Phillies want to give him fewer years. It's not probably average annual salary. Jake wants more years, more security, more financial security. Uh, there's a I, I, This deal seems to have momentum toward happening because Andy McPhail and the people in the Phillies front office, they knew Jake from their days all together in Baltimore, and it would be a great fit. And, you know, when you're a young team and you're looking for a guy to set a tone for you and all that, Jake does that. All right, sounds good. In other news, everyone is talking about Bryce Harper's impending free agency, of course, except for Bryce Harper. Is there a dark horse team that you think could maybe sign Harper that no one's really talking about? You know, because the, the financials are going to be so big, I, I don't know that there can be a dark horse. But I think the San Diego Padres are willing to spend money. And I think we saw that with Eric Hosmer. Can they, can they sign Eric Hosmer, keep Will Myers happy? Uh, add pitching and then get Bryce Harper. Well, I think sometimes you look at a guy like Bryce Harper, it's not a normal payroll expenditure. He's a marketing, he's, he's a member of the marketing team. He help, makes the team better. He raises the franchise value and all that. So that, that would be, you know, off the top of my head, you know, while I think it's going to be the usual suspects, 
uh, I, I think the, the Padres are going to be a force by the end of the year. Hmm. That could be really interesting. And uh, he's a Vegas native, so kind of going back to the West Coast is, I think, where uh, he, he could be headed, but we'll see. Uh, the Angels are lowering their right field wall by about 10 feet, Richard. When we heard this, what were your thoughts? Uh, Shohei Otani, maybe? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I think Cole Calhoun's going to be a pretty happy boy about that, too. Uh, yeah, they, it will make it a more homer-friendly ballpark. You know, and even then, on on hot days, the dry, hot weather, uh, it was a, it was a pretty, it was a, the ball flew out of there some days. But, uh, yeah, Shohei Otani, I wonder if that was part of the agreement. Hey, come here, and uh, suddenly that wall will become a little bit more friendly for a left-handed hitter. Yeah, the best part was, Oh, we're doing it because of the scoreboard slash a change in philosophy. And I was like, oh, yeah, I know what that change in philosophy is. Uh, I, I, I we, read you. We know, and, and we know what the scoreboard means, too. Yeah. We want more crooked numbers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, time for us to play Swift Justice. I'm going to ask you a few questions, and you give me a quick answer here. Uh, based on your article on MLB.com, give me one team that could still make an offseason move that you would consider a big win for that team. Brewer sign Lance Lynn. That would be a big, big win. You know, there are others, but that's one that comes to mind. All right. The Astros and Yankees clearly have won the offseason. What team do you think had the best under the radar offseason, though? You know, Brandon Drury is not a name that's going to jump off the map for Yankee fans, but neither did Aaron Hicks when they got him. Really, probably neither did Didi Gregorius when they got him. The Yankees are really smart, Alexa, at what they do. They're, they're, they have the largest analytics department in baseball, they have money to spend. And if they like a guy, I think there's a pretty good chance the guy's a good signing. So while he's not a household name, you know, if he has a big year in New York, he might be. That's pretty cool. Yeah, everyone's saying, oh, they won the offseason because of the uh, Giancarlo Stanton signing. No, Richard Justice is saying it's because of Brandon Drury. Don't get it twisted. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, which team needs to add some starting pitching to boost their chances of winning the offseason? Uh, all of them. I mean, I think every team wants a starting pitcher. Maybe the Astros are looking less comprehensively than others, but the Dodgers uh, could use a starting pitcher. The Yankees probably would not turn their back on a starting pitcher. The Angels have questions about their rotation. I would say my number one team on the list is the Giants. I, I, I still think they probably need one more arm, even after the great offseason they've had. All right, and our final Swift Justice question, which team needs to sign Mike Moustakis to be considered an offseason winner? Cardinals. I mean, he feels he completes a great offseason. You know, you would say, okay, give me Greg Holland, too, to pitch the ninth inning. Okay, I'll go for that. But uh, Mike Moustak is playing third base for the Cardinals. Just seems like such a nice fit. I, 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 you know, it's only money. All right, sounds good. Hey, Richard, since you are there in camp with the White Sox, you want to give us a little sneak peek about what we could maybe see this spring? Anyone that's jumping out to you? Oh, yeah. You know, they have six of our top 100 in the uh, in our MLB pipeline uh, top prospect 100 top prospects I mean they are loaded they're in a place where the Astros the Cubs the Royals have been in in, in previous seasons but they have a kid that's the number four prospect he's 20 years old his name is Eloy Jimenez and he is like reminds you of name it Victor Robles Byron Buxton Carlos Correa guys like that he's 20 he's ticketed to go back to double a this year but you never know, and it's in, as James Shields told me this morning, it is a very exciting time to be a White Sox fan. Yeah, a lot of uh, fans have heard about Eloy Jimenez. The fact that they could actually see him in the bigs this year would be pretty exciting. All right, Richard, thank you so much for all your information. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. All right, spring training isn't all about work. It's about eating contests, too, and Kenley Jansen knows that all too well because every spring training he holds an awesome wing eating contest for a bunch of the people that work down there at camp and a couple of the participants, too. By the way, take a listen to uh, how all of the shenanigans played out. It's a wing eating competition. Yeah. We got this wing, wing eating competition, the Kenley Jansen Cup. So we ever eat the most wings in 50 minutes, in 55 minutes, gonna win a thousand bucks, first place, 500 second place, and 250. So as you see, all these guys right now, they're crushing. Hey, this is where the turtle wins the race. It's awesome. JT's. Is it awesome? Yo, wing eating pump. All right, so that was Kenley Jansen. This is Justin Turner's Instagram Live, and he gave us a little bit more of a sneak peek behind the scenes to this wing eating contest. Those guys don't look like they're eating very quickly for a wing eating contest. I mean, come on. You only have so much time on the, on the clock. They got 55 minutes to eat as many wings as possible. By the way, a thousand bucks is up for grabs. I'd be shoving those wings down my gullet. Come on, people. 
We need to make this happen. All right. By the way, we're not sure who won, so if you want to go ahead and tweet at Kenley Jansen or Red Turn 2, maybe they'll fill you in on the details. Uh, maybe we'll also find out some of those details and let you know tomorrow. All right, uh, we wanted to ask you today your favorite spring training matchup of two guys from your own team that you would like to see, like Steven Strasburg and Bryce Harper. And you guys sent us in some awesome suggestions. So we want to read those right now here on the show. Uh, Jan Ho said Chapman versus Judge. Okay, that's a pretty good one. And Jeff said piece of cake. My spring training matchup would be to see Verlander face Altuve. You're an Astros fan, apparently, Jeff. I like that. Piece of cake. Hashtag go Astros. Justin said Sabathia versus Stanton. Oof. Man, I would really like to see that, especially CeCe's face, if he strikes him out, because CeCe really gets uh, real fired up. Old versus the new, earning the stripes. Yep, totally. Uh, Doan said Judge versus Severino, another good one. Luis Severino, dark horse for that Cy Young, and uh, Aaron Judge there, who we all know his accolades. Uh, Sean said Sale, Chris Sale versus J.D. Martinez, new teammates there up in Boston. I'd love to see that, see if he can get it over the green monster. Uh, the mini green monster, by the way, that they have replicated at their spring training facility is what I mean. Uh, Raymond says Jensen versus Seeger. Henley Jansen, after eating all of those wings, see if you could strike out Corey Seager. Matthew says Otani versus Trout. This is one, man, I was waiting for y'all to come up with this one. This is one that I think that I would really love to see and see how uh, Otani handles, uh, you know, uh, Trout's stance and, and his aggressiveness at the plate. That could be pretty cool. And then uh, Dennis said Sevi versus Drury. Man, we're using all kinds of nicknames here today. Sevi Severino, are you guys on a first name hashtag uh, kind of basis here? Uh, time to find out what we traded for. Yeah, well, Richard Justice says that the Yankees did very well in that trade. So uh, if Richard Justice says it, it's obviously. 100% true. But um, yeah, Seve versus Drury could be uh, pretty neat to see. All right. Our final story has to do with J.D. Martinez and obviously him and the Red Sox agree to that deal. And it's interesting because everyone was like, well, why Boston? Well, maybe his past birthday celebrations have uh, a little bit of a clue as to why. His sister posted a photo of the two of them hanging out at a Yankees Red Sox game for his 19th birthday. That's 19 year old JD Martinez right there, baby face. Uh, this was on August 21st back in 2006. Can you remember where you were then? Yeah, well, JD can because he's got this photo. Unfortunately, the Red Sox lost, but I'm sure it was an experience that stuck with him and his sister. So pretty cool there. And now he's going to be playing in historic Fenway Park. All right, that's going to do it for us here on 1225 Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate all the info from Alana Rizzo, Richard Justice, and our own Danny Wexelman. And uh, we're going to do it all again tomorrow. We are hopping around to all different kinds of camps. And we'll fill you in on the latest as well as any free agent or trade news that we have going on in the market. Make sure you join us, 1225 Live. See you then, everyone. Take care.